whose height was 60 cubits and its breadth six cubits. He set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then King Nebuchadnezzar sent to gather the satraps, the prefects, and the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, and the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces gathered for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And they stood, be they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And the herald proclaimed aloud, You are commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, that when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, you are to fall down and worship the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. Therefore, as soon as all the peoples heard the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, all the peoples, nations, and languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Therefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and maliciously accused the Jews. They declared to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that every man who hears the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, pay no attention to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Well, then King Nebuchadnezzar, in furious rage, commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said to them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? Now, if you are ready, when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, to fall down and worship the image that I have made, well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you from my hand? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Well, then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with fury, and the expression of his face was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He ordered the furnace heated seven more times, so seven times more than it was usually heated. And he ordered some of the mighty men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their cloaks, their tunics, their hats, and their other garments, and they were thrown into the burning, fiery furnace. Because the king's order was so urgent and the furnace overheated, the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell bound into the fiery, burning, fiery furnace. Well, then Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose up in haste. He declared to his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound into the fire? They answered and said to the king, True, O king. He answered and said, but I see four men unbound walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt, and the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. 
Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the door of the burning fiery furnace, and he declared, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. Well, then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out from the fire. And the satraps, the prefects, the governors, and the king's counselors gathered together and saw that the fire had, had not had any power over the bodies of those men. The hair of their heads was not singed, their cloaks were not harmed, and no smell of fire had come upon them. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him and set aside the king's command and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I make a decree. Any people, nation or language that speaks anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb and their houses laid in ruins. For there is no other God who is able to rescue in this way. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego in the province of Babylon. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, what a what a magnificent story. Um, what a wonderful example, and what a wonderful God revealed in it. And so, this morning, we pray that you would show us who you are, more of you, and you would show us how to live, and we would see Jesus, and that would be enough for us. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so let's just briefly recap the context of the book of Daniel, because we're only in it for two weeks, and so it's just worth repeating. Israel, the nation of Israel has found itself forced into exile, their homes destroyed, their city destroyed, the temple destroyed nothing left, all in ruin, ashen ruins. They have been transported and made to walk the 500-mile journey to the people who just captured them, to their home in Babylon. And so their physical suffering is obviously immense. And yet their physical suffering is only a part of the story of their suffering because their suffering in an even deeper way and in an even more agonizing way is the questions that came from that suffering which is, where is God? Has He not made promises to His people? And they just did not have a theological category that this could happen to God's people. And so they have the questions of, well, where is He? Does He care? Can our God survive in a world like this, right? A world of superpowers and seeming super gods, Because the battle between Israel and Babylon in their minds was not a battle between Israel and Babylon. It was also Yahweh versus Marduk. Surely Yahweh would win. And yet here we are and we're on our way to Babylon. And then they would have the additional questions of having to think through for the first time in any of their lives, how do we live when we're not in the promised land? How do we live without the temple? How do we live when the surrounding culture doesn't actually have the same background as us, think like us, are not on the same page at all? How do we do that? And those questions are actually, I think, right, linked together. The question of where is God and how do we live? Because if the answer to the first question is, well, God actually happens to to be laying dead on the battlefield back in Israel, well, then how you live in Babylon is going to be very different. You owe Him no allegiance, right? But he's, imp- he's dead. And so you may as well just fit in and assimilate and just do as the Babylonians do. But if God is not dead, and actually he was sovereign even over this, even over the, the, over the captivity of his own people, he's a sovereign God like that, well then, you owe him all of your allegiance, even whilst in Babylon. And that is exactly the kind of God we find and exactly the kind of allegiance we find in this story. So let's go. Let's get into the passage. Verse 1 begins like this. It says this, 
King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold. Now, if you were here last week, you might be thinking, come again? Come again? Now, my memory's not great, but just help me remember, did we not read last week that Nebuchadnezzar had a dream about an image where he was the golden head? And didn't this, like, dream cause him to have, like, crazy anxiety and unable to sleep and decide that whoever, if, if people couldn't tell, me, tell him what the dream was and what it meant, he was going to kill everyone? Yes, that's exactly what happened, right? And di- didn't he have the dream that, well, he was the golden head of this image and along came uh, a, a, a stone not cut from human hands and it came and knocked, took out the, the kind of feet of clay of this statue and, and, and it fell to the ground? Yes, yes, that's exactly what he was... And, and did it... it just our memory might not be good, but didn't Daniel come along and miraculously and marvelously interpret that dream to him and, and warn him and say, yeah, you should not spend your life building for yourself your own kingdom because the kingdom of God will come one day and take over all kingdoms. You should find your allegiance not to your own kingdom, but to the kingdom of God. Didn't, didn't he learn that lesson? Yes, he did. And yet we just read at the very first sentence of the next chapter, King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold. That's crazy. Because in everything that happened in chapter 2, one thing that didn't happen, obviously, is that the heart of King Nebuchadnezzar was changed. What did happen was that he had a profound experience, a powerful encounter with the power of God. That's not the same thing as a heart being changed. Uh, and some of us know that from experience, and some of us have had friends who have known that that's, those aren't the same things. That, that a person can have amazing experiences of the power of God and see miraculous things and see a- prayers answered in the most marvelous ways and have their kind of been at a conference and, ha- and seem to have had such profound encounters with God through His preaching or through people praying for them on mission trips, and just, and and seemingly, wow, you are so affected by this, and yet, as time passes on, the heart has not been changed. Because it's not the same thing. Um, Matthew Henry writes this, he said, strong convictions often come short of sound conversions. It's why we have to be careful when it comes to expressions like this, expressions like what Nebuchadnezzar had at the end of the last chapter. Do you remember the expression? Like, didn't he just, like, marvel at, man, there is no other God like this. Your God is the revealer of mysteries, right? And so I think part of what can make the modern church fairly impotent is we might have immediately gone, Nebuchadnezzar, let's get him on the preaching circuit. Like, this is going to be an amazing testimony. Let's baptize this brother. Let's get him in a small group ministry, and he can do the tour, right? Because look at the, what, I mean, what a profession. And he's not a Christian yet. Strong convictions often come short of sound conversions. He has had an experience of God, but he has not given his life to God. So what do we do? What do we know about this image um, that he that he well that he builds? First one tells us some of the details. It says that it's entirely made of gold. It's as if he was like a bit offended by the, the image in his dream. Was I was only a head of gold. Well, let's make the whole thing gold. There's no feet of clay this time. I will not make that mistake twice. It's very very tall. It's 15 times the size of the average man. Picture 15 times. That's quite a big big statue. What we don't know is the name of the statue because we're not told. Uh, some say it's a statue of Nebuchadnezzar himself. It, it may be. It doesn't say. Some say, well, it's probably one of the Babylonian gods. Again, we don't know. It doesn't say. And I think that's a, there's a reason why we don't know. It's because it doesn't actually really matter. You can call the statue whatever you like. We can call it Barry. We can call it Trevor. We can call it whatever we like because it doesn't really matter. At the end of the day, it's just a statue. And it's a thing that the king has arbitrarily said is God now. And when music plays, you need to bow down and begin to worship this thing. He isn't outlawing, it doesn't seem, the worship of other gods. He just seems to be saying, now I want everyone to add this one to the list. Maybe he was trying to unify his kingdom around the worship of one god in particular. But that's basically what he's decided. 
And so now the narrator describes it. I don't know if you picked up on, it's a little bit repetitive. Some of the things got repetitive. I don't know if you noticed that. I think the narrator is deliberately trying to mock the whole thing. It's it's just, it's it's because it's so ridiculous. All right, so let me read verses two to three um, uh, to you again and just pick up on the the kind of mockery I think that's, that's, that's evident there. So then King Nebuchadnezzar sent to gather the satraps and the prefects and the governors and the counselors and the treasurers and the justices and the magistrates and all the officials of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And then so the satraps and the prefects and the governors and the counselors and the treasurers and the justices and the magistrates and all the officials of the provinces gathered for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. It's just so repetitive and it's so ridiculous. The, the nonsense of the whole thing. I think he's just mocking the whole scene. And I love that kind of, but maybe too much. But this resonates with me. So there are, there they all stand before the image that he's just repeated over and over again. It's a thing that the king set up. That's all you need. That's seemingly all you need to know about this statue is that the king, he set it up. That's all that, that's the only thing that's special about it is the king did it and he set it up. Verse four. And so he gets this herald to come along and the herald proclaims the king's commands. He says, you are commanded, O peoples, nations and languages, that when you hear the sound of the, again, very repetitive, the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe and every kind of music. He could have just said that at the start. Just music. When you hear music. You are to fall down and worship the golden image that what? King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. So music plays, you worship, and what are you worshiping? It's an image that the king has just set up. And, who, and, then, the, and then, then there's the, um, the, you know, the kind of the stick incentive. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. Well, it escalated quickly, didn't it? You've got all the governors there, and the guy says, this is what the king says. Uh, when the music plays, you got to bow down and you need to worship that thing. And someone's like, huh, really? Do we have to? Yeah, because um, if you don't, you'll be thrown into a fire. That seems to be Nebuchadnezzar's favorite way of dealing with conflict in his kingdom. In chapter one, the steward of Daniel is afraid that if, you know, if they don't eat the right food and what have you, he's just afraid that the king's going to chop off his head. Right, last week, what did we see? The wise men, you will be ripped up limb from limb and your houses laid in ruins because you didn't do what I wanted you to do. And now, if you don't bow, I'm going to cast you into a fiery furnace. So there's the decision. There's the decision to make, be sure. Uh, to be sure, it's, it's, it's a pretty easy decision if you are already involved in the polytheistic religion um, that was going on in Babylon. It's like, okay, well, you know, what, what, what's another God to bow down and worship to anyway? You know, the, we've got a bunch of them and say, so let's just add it onto the list. Um, you know, especially when the alternative is you'll be thrown into a fiery furnace. Okay, that equation is pretty easy. We'll just add it to the list. So it says, therefore, the first seven, I love that it just says, Therefore, I mean, yeah, as soon as all the peoples heard the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, all the peoples, nations, and languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. It's the most pathetic scene you could imagine. Well, we don't want to be burned. Nebuchadnezzar said that that's God now. And so the music plays and they, get, they literally get on their knees and start to worship the thing. The thing that it once again it repeats, King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. That's all that thing is. This is not the only time that the Bible openly mocks idolatry. Um, it does it kind of semi-regularly. Uh, one of the best places is in Isaiah chapter 44, where God describes the idol-making process. It's almost like God's like, okay, just take me through it. Take me through the idol-making process and explain it to me. And it's satire, and I think it's great. So verse, four, verse 12 of Isaiah 44 says this, 
So the ironsmith takes a cutting tool and works it over the coals. He fashions it with hammers and works it with his strong arm. He becomes hungry and his strength fails. He drinks no water and is faint. Point is, it's actually really hard work. Sometimes you have to work really hard to make up a new God, right? It's, it's tiring stuff. You might sweat. Well, verse 14 says this, He cuts down cedars, or he chooses a cypress tree or an oak, and lets it grow strong among the trees of the forest. He plants a cedar, and the rain nourishes it. Then it becomes fuel for a man. He takes a part of it and warms himself. He kindles a fire and bakes bread. Isn't that so good? So you build, you get, you have this great tree, and you think, well, what am I going to do with the tree? We chop it down, and there's a few different uses that some, they're very natural, obvious uses. The person's like, I, I need a fire. We could use the tree for fire, right? And he says, yeah, fire. Well, we can do two things with fire. We can warm ourselves, and we can bake bread. Sounds excellent. Good, obvious uses of the tree. And then the next line is this. Also, he makes a god and worships it. He makes it an idol and falls down before it. Half of it he burns in the fire. Over the half he eats meat, he roasts it and is satisfied. Also, he warms himself and says, Aha, I am warm. I have seen the fire. And the rest of it he makes into a god, his idol, and falls down to it and worships it. He prays to it and says, deliver me, for you are my God. I think that's sanctified sarcasm. That's the person coming along. Oh, you've got your log there? Okay, so, I mean, you know, you can imagine the conversation with someone who's like, yeah, no, you know, okay, so which, just help me out so I know which half of this log is God and which one's for the fire, because... I don't want to mix it up, you know. I don't want to worship just wood that's for fire making. That'd be silly. And I also don't want to put God in the fire. So I just give me clarity. Now, we have to be careful, don't we? Because the Bible has a great way of, whilst we find the, the, the silliness in others, we soon find that we're laughing, oh, at ourselves. And we stop laughing. Because what the Bible does is with the with the theme of idolatry is broaden it out throughout the Bible from statues, well, to anything that we would replace God with, like the God of the universe, anything that we would kind of just put in His place as our priority, that we give more time, more of our money, more of our uh, thinking, more of our affections, more of our desires. We are worshipping beings. We're always worshipping. The question is, what are we worshipping? And so, in Philippians, it talks about people whose God is their belly. Now, Ephesians talks about covetousness as idolatry. I want what you have. Well, that's another form of idolatry. Romans 1 talks about how the, 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 kind of the basis of the whole thing is that you, have re- you are replacing the Creator with created things. And so we, modern people, we hear the harp, lyre, trigon music of sport and like mindless drones that we see in this passage, hearing the music bow down. We, like mindless drones, we hear the music of sport. Man, like in our culture, we, we just go to the television, we sit down, we turn it on and we look at it and we cheer on and we get really angry at the enemy and we sing our team songs of worship. We spend money on attire so we look good for the game and, and it's all the hallmarks of worship. And in a loving kind of sarcasm, God's Word might say, really? You guys, kicking a football has really captured your heart. And I'm offering you the kingdom of God and forgiveness of your sins. Let's move on from that one because it touches a bit too close to home. We hear the harp, lyre, trigon, music of all kinds of advertising, right? And we see on the things, you know, the pretty people and they've got the pretty things and they're smiling. So it just seems like we're so happy that they have the toothbrush or whatever it is. And, and, and you're just like, man, I think I'd, I'd love to be that happy, you know. I'd love to have that toothbrush or whatever it is. And, and it captures our hearts and, 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 and the Lord would look at that and go, Really? And you're going to focus? Your, your life is a mist. It's here this morning, gone by the end of the morning, like dew on the ground. 
you're going to spend your life on the temporary things, you have an eternity, eternity, life without end ahead of you. Really? We hear the music, harp, lyre, trigon of our favorite TV show. You know, the, you know, shows used to begin with a jingle. And you're like, oh, okay, the show's on. You know, go sit down. Let's, let's have all our kinds of entertainments. And we sit there for a few hours binging. That's the new, newish thing, isn't it? Binging, just binging away for hours on end with no time then to pray, to read God's word, to know God. And God would say, in maybe loving sarcasm, so this is what you want to gaze on? This is it? That's it? You know that that TV show doesn't love you, hey? You know that that Netflix doesn't have any kind of affections for you. It's never going to, like, die for you and save you. It's just going to take stuff from you, really. Man, the music and the, all the instruments of social media play, man, don't they? You know, the notifications pop up and they're summoning you. And they're like, no, you've heard the music. Now look at your phone. And like mindless drones, just staring, scrolling, just wasting, you know. And the God might say, really? This screen that for the most part leaves you feeling empty and anxious and less and dissatisfied. You're going to keep going back to that? Keep going back to that? Giving it your time and your attention and your thought and your heart? Idolatry. See, it's not just, idolatry is not just an evil thing. It's not just a wrong thing. It's a dumb thing. And I think that's what this passage is saying. So in the story, everyone do, just does what Nebuchadnezzar says. That's everyone. Like, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be hard not to do it once you're kind of like you're into all those kind of different gods. And so we immediately think of Daniel and his friends and we're like, huh, okay, I wonder how they're going to go with, with this. They didn't eat the king's food in the chapter one. I'm not sure they're going to be down for kind of bowing down to a new statue. And so here's the dynamic where it's, it, it kind of becomes not that funny as a story, actually, and it kind of moves from being a children's story that most children know through their kind of Sunday school education. But it's not really just a children's story, is it? it we, we suddenly have a very real sense that the people of God are being threatened with their lives. You must compromise or die. And it just hits different. It hits different, obviously, because we're here, and we're generally just not facing that. But in other countries, and certainly throughout church history, this is just such a very real thing. Compromise or die. Recant or die. So the accusations come against them. Those useless bunch of wizards from last week reappear to do some dobbing on the, on the Israelites. And verse 10 says, You, O king, so they come, You, O king, look how they, they try to flatter him. You, O king, have made a decree. That every man who hears the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. Right? So then, then in verse 12, they name, it's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Right? And then they try to get the king as personally offended as they possibly can make him. They know he's a narcissist. And they're going to play to that. Right? These men, O king, pay no attention to you. They do not serve your gods. Or worship the golden image that you have set up. Well done. Verse 13, Then Nebuchadnezzar, in furious rage, commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought to him. So they come in, and the king asks, Is this true? And he says, You can have a second chance. I'm going to give you a second chance. If you do it now, well and good. <clears throat> but he says, and he says it again, it's repeated again, that when they hear the pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, You'll be good. But again, just so you're clear, if you don't, you'll be burned immediately. And he finishes with this ominous question. You see the question at the end there? And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? So just think about the options for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego right now. What, what are their options? What are they actually faced with? Are they actually faced with, actually, you know what? I think the statue actually is God. Like, is that one of the options where they're going to go, you know what, I think you're right. Now that you say it, right, and you threaten us like that, 
we truly do now think that the statue is God and we're going to bow down to it. That's not really on the, one of the options, is it? Right? So if they do go and do it, it's not because they actually believe it. The temptation right now is just to compromise. And you can imagine like <clears throat> someone saying, not them, I don't think they did at all. But it's like the thought process going on in our minds, like, I mean, couldn't we just do it? We know it's not real. You know, like, couldn't we just pretend, like, I'm just going to get down and kind of fix up my straps on my thing, you know, my sandals, and then the king's going to think that that was, I was bowing. I wasn't really bowing. I was just doing up my laces. And, and, and you know, couldn't we just do that? I mean, what, if, what harm would it be if we did just bow down to this, this statue anyway? It's not real. It's just a thing that the king set up. We could just do it. Our hearts aren't in it. Like, it's just fake. The whole thing's a joke. We're young. We're full of potential. We've got our whole lives ahead of us. We're the best of the best, the brightest of the brightest from Israel. We're, we're in high positions. We should not throw our lives away for this. It's just so silly. The thing is, of course, if they bow down, they're definitely not gen- genuinely thinking, this is God, we should worship it. But they still will be worshipping. And what they would be worshipping, of course, is themselves. They'll be full of thoughts of themselves, their own lives. And they will have believed the lie that there's nothing worse than death. But there is. There is something worse than death. And that's to deny God, to walk away from God. That's why it's a heavy passage, I think, in the end. Because it explicitly tells us, as God's people, prefer to die than to deny Christ. I remember at Bible College, um, various lectures that my principal, Mike Rader, used to give us, because they weren't lectures, they, they often ended up in sermons. And, and, he, and he, you know, to us, kind of a bunch of young people, you know, potential gospel workers in the future. He, I remember him saying these exact words. He says, you just need to remember, you need to know there is a fate that's worse than death for you. There is a fate worse than death for you. And that is, you would begin to deny the gospel, you would begin to preach a different gospel. It would be better to die. It would be better to die than to lead other people astray into false gospels, to lead them into hell. And I remember thinking, man, and remember praying, Lord, take me out before that day. Before I go that direction, please end me. Death is not your greatest danger. If you are a Christian here this morning, death is not your greatest only danger. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they answer so quickly. It's like just reflex for them. they got just got reflexes for this kind of thing. Because they're not making up their mind in that moment. You get the sense that... They have made a decision a long time ago in their life that they just prepared them for this. They have lived lives of faithfulness, so it comes to this moment, and they don't have to kind of get together and go, oh man, this is tempting. No, not even, not for a moment. This is why this passage is so helpful for us. It helps us prepare for the day. Man, if that day happened, recant or die, but every other sense of compromise or face this, Man, passages like this to be ready for the moment so our reflexes are just godly and faithful to the Lord. So verse 16, they say, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. That's amazing. We don't need to answer this. We have no need to answer you. There's nothing to be said. You want us to do something which you have not a a literal chance in hell of us ever doing. So do your worst. God could save us. He may save us. He might not save us. We are not going to bow down to this statue. Not in a million years. And men of God, hey, they know their Bibles. They know that God said, thou shalt not worship any carved image. You shall not bow down to them. You shall not serve them. So they decided, God said we don't do that. We just don't do that. They're willing to die before dishonoring the Lord. 
And notice that they know that God is sovereign. God is very sovereign over this. That, that's the most, like, they are faithful to God, with, and they basically say, and we have no prior knowledge of how this will end up for us. God can save us, He can save us, and if He does, we are saved. That's if He decides. But we actually don't know. In this moment, when we're, when we're responding to you, we don't know. And it's irrelevant to us that whether we knew or not, because we're not bowing down. This is amazing. It's like Queen Esther, isn't it? When Queen Esther had to make the decision, do I go before the king um, and risk my life in order to, to, to save my people? Do I go before the king because you go before the king unannounced and he'll, he'll just kill you? And what is her words? If I perish, I perish. I don't know. I have no kind of supernatural revelation about how this is going to go for me. If I perish, I perish. The Apostle Paul said a similar thing in Acts chapter 20. He says, I'm going to Jerusalem constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there. Except, this is what he does know, that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. But I do not count my life of any value, nor as precious to myself. And if only I may finish my course and the ministry that I have received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. What they lack, what the Bible, biblical, godly, biblical characters lack, is the kind of like self-assured spiritual triumphalism which permeates the modern church at times. The kind of like, I just know God's got great things in store and it's always going to work out so well. I know that, you know, at the start of the year, this is going to be a year of great blessing and it's going to go so good. And there is vision and there is this and there is that. And, and this person, there is no doubt that you will be healed of this and cause untold damage. They never say, he might not. And he might not. He can do this, and he can do that, and he can do all of these things. And at the same time, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego say, and he might not. And it's irrelevant to us as to whether we're going to be faithful to him and his word. But that's what they're saying. It's amazing. Nebuchadnezzar, of course, is not happy. Verse 19, Nebuchadnezzar was filled with fury. And the expression on his face was changed. Love to see that face. But he orders the furnace to be heated seven times hotter. What is the point of that? Burn, like fire is going to kill you and burn you either way. Seven times hotter. He's just full of rage. Like irrational rage. Okay, now let me read what happens next. And you know, if we could just try to hear it for the first time. After everything we've heard so far, like in that moment. Man, they are so bold. But what's going to happen? Let me read from verse 20. And he ordered some of the mighty men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their cloaks, in their tunics, their hats, and their other garments, and they were thrown into the burning, fiery furnace. And because the king's order was so urgent and the furnace overheated, the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell bound into the burning, fiery furnace. If you're kind of reading the story, in that moment, you know, I, can, I, I can imagine if you saw it on the movies, you'd be like, oh, man, I just thought maybe they would get saved. But there they go. I just thought maybe God would intervene. And the narrator, you can see, just tries to slow down the story so that we enter into it. Even lists all the different items of clothing that they're wearing, like slow, like putting it in slow-mo, if you like, so that we would feel it and sense it, waiting for divine intervention that at this point has not come. Oh, man. Now, if it was a movie, then the camera just switches from they're thrown in and then it switches straight to the face of King Nebuchadnezzar. Right? Do you notice the next verse? And he acts in a, in a way that you, if you're not seeing that slide, that's, that shot, you're like, why is he reacting like this? It's bizarre. Because it says, 
Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose up in haste. He declared to his counselors, did we not cast three men bound into the fire? Uh, yes, we did. He says, but I see four men unbound walking in the midst of the fire. I love that. Just they're walking around. You know, like I, you can imagine if you're in the fire and it's not burning you, you'd be like, yo, you know, and I don't know, might start to, whatever. You walk around. They're walking around. And, he, and Nebuchadnezzar says, and they are not hurt, and the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. Oh, amazing. So Nebuchadnezzar calls them out. He may as well not stay in there. He may as well come out. So verse 27 says this, love this. And the satraps, the prefects, the governors, and the king's counselors gathered together. The same word, the same group of people gathering, the same word that they did around what? The statue. Now those same people do the same word, gather, but now what are they gathering around? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they saw, it says, that the fire had not had any power over the bodies of these men. The hair on their heads was not singed, their cloaks were not harmed, and no smell of fire had come upon them. Like, this goes to the very, like, do you think they they got affected by the fire in the smallest amount? Like, maybe they smell a bit like fire. I I can spend, like, just a moment around a campfire and it's a stink of smoke. Nothing. It's just the emphasis. Not a thing. And in response to this, Nebuchadnezzar does, I think, classic Nebuchadnezzar. He says some amazing things, praises God. And then he says, and if anyone doesn't praise, you know, says anything bad about this God, I'm going to tear their limbs off and lay their houses in ruin. Okay, so he's not quite getting it yet. <clears throat> then he says in verse 29, listen to this. For there is no other God who is able to rescue in this way. Well, that's true. So that's the passage. So our, our two big questions, you remember, where is God? How are we to live? Well, where is God? The whole chapter is set up, isn't it, as it's not just the king versus these guys. The whole thing is set up as Yahweh versus Babylon. God versus Babylon. Remember, Nebuchadnezzar commands all the peoples, nations, and language to fall down and worship his statue that he set up. Well, he's flying in the face of God. He threatens Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego with these words of, of confrontation. He says, who is the God that will deliver you out of my hands? Like the, all those guys get around his statue. So what happens in the battle between Yahweh and Babylon? Well, they're thrown into the fiery, into the fiery furnace, into the flames. But who dies? It's not the guys thrown in. It's the people who threw them in. It's the king's guys. What does Nebuchadnezzar, or what, what, what do the kind of the, the prefects and all those governors end up gathering around at the end? Not the statue anymore. It's God's people. Nebuchadnezzar ends up having to confess the answer to his question, right? Because who's going to save you? Well, he has to answer it himself. There is no other God who is able to rescue you in this way. No other God can rescue in this way. Think about that. In Egypt, God's people were enslaved in what Moses called in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 20, the iron furnace, and God saved them. Isaiah called exile in Babylon, he called it the furnace of adversity, Isaiah 48, verse 10, and God rescues them from that. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, of course, are thrown into a fiery furnace, and God rescues them by one who looks like a son of God. Well, fast forward, and in the fullness of time, Jesus, the Son of God, does arrive, and He saves us exactly from what He calls in Matthew 13, the fiery furnace, which is hell. Only God can save in this way. In this way. In what way? I think it's significant just the way that God saves them. Right? He could have saved them in any way He wanted to. He could have just plucked them out of that fire, you know, the furnace. Right? He could have intervened so that they never fell in there in the first place. He could have done all kinds of things. What does He do? He enters into the flames. He meets them there. Why? Because that's how He saves it's exactly what Jesus did when he entered into the flames, the flames that we deserved, the flames of the white hot, just and righteous wrath of God stored up for the unrighteous. 
entered into that and took it all. He took it all. So he didn't just stay apart and pull us out. He enters in and he takes it on himself. Everything that we deserve. There is no other God who saves in this way. Every other God says, save yourself. Do this, do this, do this. But there is one God who saves like this, and it's grace, and it's kindness, and he enters in. There is no other God who so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever would believe in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. We're all looking for salvation from something. Different kinds of hell. TV might save us from boredom hell. Relationships save us from our loneliness hell. Our cool clothes might save us from uncool hell. Our money might save us from poverty hell. Social media might save us from insignificance or unknown hell. But what about the eternal hell of fire? Who can save you from that? Would you this morning be saved from hell? There is a Savior who saves like this. And there is only one. And man, he saves in this way. He came and he took the punishment that we deserved on the cross for our sins. And it didn't defeat him. He didn't die. He walked out of the grave, untouched, unharmed, to live forever. He is the first fruits of the resurrection for all of God's people, that even death itself will not stop our lives. We will rise again, untouched, unharmed for all eternity if our faith and our trust is put in Jesus. Only God can save in this way. Would you be saved this morning? That's the first question. The second question is, well, how do we live as exiles? And I, surely this, was, this story must have been an encouragement to Israel. To man, stay faithful. You're in Babylon, but stay faithful. Man, we can feel like we're, you know, we're in that Babylon. You know, Australia's gone through different transitions over the past decades where what could have felt homish to the Christian, a lot of positivity around church and, and, and Christian morality, man, just might become more and more feeling like Babylon. You go, man, where, can God survive in a day like ours? Where is he in a day like ours? Well, surely a story like this just galvanizes you, doesn't it? I'm going to be faithful to the end, and I don't know what's going to happen. But whatever happens, I don't have special revelation to tell me everything's going to work out really well for me. That's irrelevant to my faithfulness. <clears throat> it's the witness of church history. It's the witness of countless martyrs, even in our day. It's the witness of the Bible. 2 Timothy 3 12 says, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Jesus in Matthew 10 said this, Behold, I'm sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Beware of men, for they will deliver you over to courts and flog you in the synagogues. And you will be dragged before governors and kings for my sake, to bear witness before them and the Gentiles. It says in verse 22, And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. For the one who endures to the end will be saved. Goes on to say, the disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for the disciple to be like his teacher and the servant like his master. Well, if they've called the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those of his household? The Apostle Paul wrote from prison, It is my eager expectation and hope that I will not at all be ashamed but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honoured in my body, whether by life or by death. Either way, don't know. But for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. The Apostle Peter says the same thing. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when His glory is revealed. If you're insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. Remember what God promised in Isaiah 43? Think about these words. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you and through the rivers and they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned 
and the flame shall not consume you, for I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Notice that the, the promise there is not that you'll never go through the water. The promise there is not that you'll never go through the fire. You will go through the water. You will go through the fire. What's the promise? I will be with you. Praise God. So this chapter teaches us as exiles to remember this morning that there is a fate that is far worse than death. It would be to choose no fire and therefore no price. A passage like, like this are meant to prepare us beforehand for that day. But man, we don't need to wait till our life is on the line to be faithful and not compromise. So how we do it? And if we weren't willing to give up awkwardness or just some relational tension for the sake of faithfulness to Christ, and let's be faithful in the small things. And if that day happens, we'll be ready with the reflexes of a Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We have nothing to say in this matter. We've already decided, right? I was thinking about this song just in preparation. I don't know if you, you know this song. I remember hearing it lots in my home growing up. Anyone know George Beverly Shea? Anyway, anyway, he had a song like this. It says this, I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather be his than have riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus than houses or land. I'd rather be led by his nail-pierced hand than to be the king of a vast domain and be held in sin's dread sway. I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world affords today. I'd rather have Jesus than worldly applause. I'd rather be faithful to His dear cause. I'd rather have Jesus than worldwide fame. Yes, I'd rather be true to His holy name. If you're not a Christian here this morning, you might go, that... You are not convincing me that I want to be a Christian with that suffering talk. Um, but I think I, I am, because I'm saying what we've found in Christ is what the, what the psalmist said, His love is better than life. We would choose His love over our own life. Maybe you're a bit tired of trying to find that kind of satisfaction in the temporary things of this world. And maybe you've gone from this thing to this thing to this thing, and coming up empty man, you're replacing the creator with creation. I don't mean to be rude. It's a dumb choice. It's a silly choice. So choose Christ. Put your faith in Him. You get Him and you get eternal life. And as the psalmist said again, His love is better than life. Let me pray.